Hi everyone, this is Dr. Tom Garcia. I'm going to be a co-presenter on this webcast entitled Arrhythmia Recognition, the Art of Education. I'd like to start off by thanking all of you for coming here and for participating in this webinar series. I hope to make it as interesting and as worthwhile for you guys as I can. We are going to start off a little slow because I do want to lay down some basic foundations about philosophy. In addition, we're really proud to announce that this will be the first of a series of webcasts that I'm going to be presenting on this topic, mostly dedicated towards the concepts of adult education, teaching you about the different adjuncts and illustrations and graphics and programs that we can have to beef up our lectures on various rhythm disturbances. I'll be focusing on each rhythm with particular emphasis on those topics. My back will be strongly watched and reinforced by my son, Daniel Garcia, who is also the co-presenter of this project. Next, I'd like to thank Jones and Bartlett, who's been my publisher for 15 years. I'd especially like to thank my editor, Ms. Carol Guerrero, who's a real godsend. And she understands me, she understands my concepts, and she puts up with me. <laughs> She's put up with me for a lot of years. So um, I really appreciate you, Carol, and I really appreciate Jones and Bartlett. I'd like to give you a little history about the books, because I think it does add some information as to what we're going to be talking about today. At the time, I pitched the concept of the teaching text in a friendly, conversational style with tons of graphics. Most of the people in the field thought I was psychotic, mostly because the books were usually written in black and white text. They had very few graphics, very few examples. They're boring, difficult to comprehend at the beginner's levels because everything was a spoken word. It's very difficult to understand the spoken word unless you have a very good grasp on the topic. So beginners and intermediate levels students really had a very hard time finding a text that would be appropriate for them to learn from. Now, I developed my style by teaching everyone at all levels. And I've been trying since forever to try to master this concept of adult education and of getting information across to students. It's something that's going to be continuously going in my life, and I really do enjoy the heck out of it. I realize that treating students like my equals and having a little fun with the subject matter caused it to be a heck of a lot more fun, and it actually made the information stick in those little crevices in between their sulci of their brain. One of the main drawbacks for publishing a book like mine was actually the fact that graphics are extremely expensive. Some of the graphics have actually been told by many people that actually cost up to about $10,000 in total cost from creation to publication. And, and it's kind of prohibitive when you get a book that has hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of graphics and examples. So what I started doing was, as I was giving my lectures, I would form medical illustrations of the concepts that I wanted to portray. And I learned the programs of Photoshop and Illustrator and Flash. And by learning those programs, I was able to actually do it myself. So when I decided to publish a book, I took all these illustrations and I actually put them together. So when I gave it to them, I gave them graphics that were fairly well advanced. And they bit hook, line, and sinker because they understood my concept, they understood where I was coming from, and it was going to be a trendsetter for the time. And it has proven to be correct. Since that time, hundreds if not thousands of educators have used these type of concepts in their daily lectures. And a lot of authors have emulated exactly that same protocol. I'd like to thank all of you instructors, by the way, for supporting the books and for giving me such tremendous feedback throughout the years. And I hoped and want to reinforce the fact that upcoming editions, which we're going to be working on, are going to have even more graphics, more examples, and more information that's going to be really helpful. So what's the purpose of this webcast series? Why do we decide to do it? Well, my main reason for doing it is because I felt that electrocardiography and arrhythmia recognition in general were being pushed to the wayside. They're becoming kind of a dying art. And it's dying out not because it's being made obsolete because of additional information, but because of the squeezing effect that's occurring in our universities and in our colleges. Let's get into that a little bit further. Since the mid-1900s, medicine has exploded with a ton of new information. As a matter of fact, when you think about it, antibiotics weren't really created until 1950s. The advent of these new therapeutic agents and techniques have progressed at a staggering pace since that time. 
The result of these discoveries is that clinicians are now faced with an ever-expanding need to broaden their knowledge base. They have less and less time dedicated to studying a particular aspect of clinical knowledge. The academic institutions graduating the clinicians as well have to make certain choices. They're constantly facing the choice of either increasing the number of years of classwork or of restructuring the amount of time allocated to each subject. Now, here's an interesting fact. Medical education for physicians in, in 1876 was four years long. In 2015, it's still exactly four years long, despite the explosion of information that's occurred. Adding to the number of years is really not a viable option because people do not want to spend more time in classroom than they have to. We already have a shortage of clinicians. Now you have to start adding more time and what's going to happen? You're going to have even less. So the only other possibility is to decrease the amount of time that they spend on each topic. The net result is that now we're forced to teach more material with less time if you're an educator at one of these colleges or universities. Since I graduated med school in 1986, I've noticed a continuous decline in the ability of clinicians to interpret ECGs and rhythm strips. My residents are really having a hard time understanding the concepts of ECGs and rhythm strips, and half the time they don't even interpret them. It's a real shame because that is just such a great bedside test that you can get for like pennies, and the amount of information that you get at the moment's notice without having to wait for these tests to be done hours later is tremendous. So it's partly due to the lure newer technologies because as we have newer and newer stuff coming out, everybody wants to gravitate towards the new and forget about the old. But the main culprit is that ECGs and arrhythmias have fallen on the sacrificial altar of time. Schools are spending less time focusing on these topics. And since they're spending less and less time, the students are getting this idea that it's not as important. It's been shown in the educational literature that prejudice prior to studying a subject will make a tremendous difference on whether the person actually assimilates that knowledge into their everyday practice or whether they discard it. The purpose of this web series is to sound up wake up call for everybody who wants to keep these tests alive because of their clinical importance. We're appealing to you, the ancillary medical educators, to help carry that banner in your respective fields. When I worked at Grady Memorial Hospital, I started a flagship program to try to teach electrocardiography to nurses and paramedics. What I was thinking was, who are the people that spend the most time with the patients? Well, it's the people who transport them and the people who take care of them when they're inside the hospital. Physicians literally walk in spend a few minutes with the patient and walk out, order some tests, get the results, and then they come back and either tell them the good news or the bad news. The ones who actually spend time with the patients are the nurses and the paramedics. So by concentrating on them, I figured that less and less electrocardiograms would be missed or misinterpreted. It worked out exactly that way. My nurses were picking up Posterior myocardial infarctions, which the physicians were picking up. That caused me a lot of aggravation, but you know what? It was worth it because a bunch of patients had their lives saved or had the morbidity decreased because of the fact that those findings were picked up quicker and treatment was started faster. You guys are educators to the ancillary medical groups. You guys need to push these envelopes. We will be reviewing the philosophy behind the arts and science of interpretation. And we'll provide you with some of the advances in medical education that are now available to you, especially adult medical education. By utilizing these newer concepts and upgraded material found in the newer text and also in the web, and showing you the power of utilizing computer-generated graphics to increase your lecture potential and efficiency, the amount of time needed to educate a student to an intermediate level is actually nowhere near as long as you think. In as little as 10 hours of classroom time, a student can be brought up to speed. That's pretty significant. I know. I've proven it. We hope to provide you, the educators of our future generations of clinicians, the tools that are available to you and help you reformulate your new teaching paradigm. 
society will thank you, your students will thank you, and the thousands of lives that they in turn will save will thank you. This webcast series consists of 10 individual parts. Let's take a look at these now so we know what's coming up. The first one talks about general philosophy and the philosophy of teaching. The next is national standards. One of the things that people constantly come up to me and tell me is that the national standards don't intend for me to understand this. On this little section, I hope to be able to show you that your national standards do hold you to a very high level of excellence. And if you don't follow it, you will be responsible. We're going to look at tools, and Daniel will be talking about that. And we're talking about it from a beginner's perspective rather than from a more advanced perspective. And then I'm going to take over and I'm going to give you some of my inputs on different things, with, especially related to books. In the next section, we're going to get into tools, tips, and techniques. We're going to go over the specifics about mechanisms and why they are so critical to the evaluation of any electrocardiogram or strip. We're also going to give you some techniques and some tips. So we're going to review some of the concepts of adult education in a little bit more depth. To prove that to you, we're going to put it all together. Okay. At the end, I'm going to give you an example. And that example is going to be a pretty complex example. And I want you to take a look at it, try to come up with an answer for it. And then we're going to go through the mechanism of how it arrives. All right. As a teaser... I'm going to present the unknown now. So you can take a look at it and then just ponder over it for the next few days. It's important that when you proceed through these sections that you try to maintain the order in which they were written. Because otherwise, by skipping ahead, you're actually doing yourself a disservice. Because we go back and talk about some of the information before. After the unknown, we're going to go through parts 6 through 10. That's where the real nitty-gritty of this lecture is going to be. The first part, parts 1 through 5, talk about philosophy and about the basic background. Parts 6 through 10 are specifics about the particular rhythms and about arrhythmia recognition in general. Part 6 talks about teaching arrhythmia basics. Here we're going to go over stuff like um, aberrancy, premature contractions, escape rhythms, those kind of things. Then we're going to do part 7, which, in which include all the sinus and atrial rhythms. Part 8 is going to discuss the AV nodes and its rhythms. Part 9 is going to focus on ventricular rhythms. And then Part 10 is going to be a webcast, question and answer period. Now, this webcast is going to be focused on your feedback. We're going to take, we're going to take a look at 5 to 10 questions which you have submitted to us for review. And we're going to try to answer them as much as possible. We're going to concentrate on giving you a short discussion about the particular question and then we're going to have a very brief period of maybe five to ten minutes after each discussion. We hope we've made our philosophy and the, and the progression of the webcast series as clear as possible. If there's any questions, call us. At the end of every section, we're going to give you the information where you can actually contact us. And myself or Daniel will get back to you with the pertinent information to answer your questions individually. We thank you very much for your participation, and we hope you really get a lot out of this because we're having a real blast putting it together. Thanks a lot for your help. Bye-bye.